Welcome! I am Chris, first disciple of God Getty, and host of the God Getty Show. And my co-host is Sheeps. This pilot episode is a brief introduction to God Getty, a superposition of God, Creator, and FSM. Don't worry if any of these terms are new to you. We'll explore them all, but then put it back together again. I have faith that you will find God Getty as vital and as comforting in your day-to-day -day life as I do. God Getty, the creator of all, also created science and something us humans call superposition. You may have heard of Schrodinger's cat. It's in a box, maybe dead, maybe alive. Perhaps you think of it like a coin flip. Heads, cat's dead. Tails, cat's alive. The coin and cat are hidden in a box. And the coin has already been flipped, and we discover an already dead or a still alive cat upon opening the box. That's how I first thought of Schrodinger's cat, as a simple hidden coin flip. But that's not really what superposition is. The cat's living state is in a superposition. I've struggled to understand what it means when something is in a superposition. How about you, sheeps? It's like thinking about infinity or paradoxes, but it's good to stretch my mind. The cat is both completely alive and completely dead. It's like a third state where both of the contradictory states are true. See where this bit of science helps us navigate our tricky paradoxical world? I have total faith that the God of the Bible is real and alive in my Schrodinger's box. I also have total faith that the flying spaghetti monster is real and alive in Schrodinger's box too. The flying spaghetti monster reminds me to stay humble in my religious beliefs and not oppose them on others because they have their own religious beliefs. This superposition of seemingly paradoxical faiths, a super faith, I call it, allows me to stay true to the conservative Christian values I was raised with and treat my Muslim, Buddhist, Mormon, etc. neighbor with the same respect as my Christian neighbor. It begins in Smallville, Indiana, circa 1970. During my most formative years, our working class family attended a conservative Christian church and I attended a public school. While inflation ran in double digits and my father's hours got cut at the factory. AIDS and unemployment were revealed to be a judgment from God and the collection plate was passed as a solution. We were living in the end times, as the TV preachers called it, while showing clips of ominous nuclear mushroom clouds, wars and rioting in the streets. Our whole family really, really got into the Bible, church, and these conservative Christian teachings. Circa 1986, my father and I disagreed on when Jesus would return. He promoted our community's religious belief that Jesus would return before the end of the 1980s. I too believed in Jesus' return, but upon reading Revelation, where God's plans for the end times are cryptically spelled out, it seemed logically impossible by 1990. I want to be clear here. Circa 1986, I shared my community's Midwest American conservative Christian beliefs that we were living in the end times and that Jesus' second coming was soon. It's just that after reading the source material, I decided it would take more than four years for all those prophecies to happen. My faith and logic had to agree. It was a confusing time. It continues circa 2000 with two miracles. The first involved my brother, who remained a conservative Christian and who has endured countless hours of my questions about God and the Bible and has been truly helpful in my religious quest. I had left the church of my parents, but was still seeking God, praying and reading the Bible. I felt God, and logically I reasoned that there must be more 
than what I see and know, because what I see and know doesn't explain existence. My brother believed church attendance is necessary by God's design. It's where us humans learn about and commune with God. He encouraged me to attend a local affiliate of his church. I showed up in a baseball cap. The first and only word spoken to me harshly, hats must not be worn in the sanctuary. I left that church too before the service even started. Okay, getting to the first miracle. The same conversation where my brother had encouraged me to attend church, he recounted a recent blessing that he had received from God in church. A neighbor of his had complained about a dangerous tree, but God blew down the tree, damaging nothing. And church members arrived with a truck, trailer, and tools to help clean up the downed tree God provides. Within a few days, a mighty storm came blowing in suddenly, and a massive tree on my property fell right before my eyes, also damaging nothing. A day or two later, I was mowing the grass, literally praying to God to please reveal himself to me. Must I only find you, God, at church, as my brother insists, where I don't fill you and where everyone seems as, obs as obsessed as Pharisees? with loveless, thoughtless rule following? Or can I continue to seek you, God, on my own, praying and reading the Bible? The exact second I finished that prayer, a small blue car stopped next to the house, and a young man jumped out, jumped out and ran over to me. Are you gonna use that tree? Can we have it? Um, no, I don't need it. Sure, you can have it. The next morning, the entire fallen tree and all its associated mess of leaves and small branches were just gone. If it weren't for the sound of a chainsaw early that morning and some sawdust, I would have thought an angel had visited me from that blue car and that Jesus himself had moved that tree like a mountain. Coincidence, maybe, but I didn't return to that church or any church and I finished reading the Bible and I still felt God. Okay, the second miracle, also circa 2000. I was hiking with a buddy in a national forest in Kentucky. I had an empty plastic water bottle, and it just didn't fit comfortably in any pocket, and I just wanted to be free of that burden. I had been avoiding littering because love thy neighbor. It was just me and my buddy, and he was ahead out of view. I could just toss the bottle. Nobody would know, and I wouldn't have to carry it. I heard the voice of God in my head, not audible, but it was so clearly spoken from outside of me. God said, no, and somehow also carried the meaning of, this is wrong and you know it. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. They're doing it now, just remembering it. I squished that bottle down and carried it out in my pocket. I religiously avoid littering. I even had to create rules around what is and what is not littering. If I'm on a walk and see something I, and I pick it up, at that point I cannot throw it back down. But I can nudge it or roll it over with my shoe and still leave it. And something like an apple core or a small bit of wood can be discarded to the ground if it will likely not negatively impact. I enjoy hiking in litter-free nature, thus I must not litter. Thou shall not litter is not one of the original Ten Commandments, but it fits squarely in the second of Jesus' short list of two. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And that brings us to today, circa 2022. Amazing thing is, much like the prophet in the Old Testament that promised God not to undress girls with his eyes as his act of faith, I continue to avoid littering and generally try to love my neighbor as myself and God blesses me. I don't attend church. I tried being agnostic, but that leaves something missing. And it didn't help me navigate my modern American life where I believe in religious freedom, yet must lead children in saying under God at school. The US Supreme Court has shown that it values religious beliefs above other sincerely held beliefs. 
As an agnostic, I doubt a legal, legal protection of any of my sincerely held beliefs, regardless of how core they were to me. But as a disciple of God Getty, I am following sincerely held religious beliefs. I have full faith in my American conservative upbringing, as it was presented by my elders. I also have full faith in the flying spaghetti monster, as I must remain humble to respect others' religious beliefs, as that level of respect is what I want for myself. And Jesus commands, love my neighbor as myself. Yes, even the Hindu one, even the Jewish one, and even the <gasps> atheist one. Thus, I must always strive for a superposition of faiths, which I call super faith, where I have faith in my Christian upbringing and faith to act in perceived contradiction to the Bible or religious leaders and traditions when loving my neighbor as myself requires it. Can I ever achieve a state of super faith? Yes, but in my experience, it is soon lost and must be strived for again. It is truly difficult to maintain a superposition where I have complete faith in God's command to kill all witches and complete faith in Jesus' command to love my neighborhood witches myself and need to follow the 1964 Civil Rights Act where a witch's religious beliefs are not to be discriminated against. If I were a witch and happened to live next door to sheep, I want sheeps not to kill me. Just saying, don't kill me, sheeps. You could live your life as an example. You could pray for me. But please, sheeps, don't kill your neighbor. So yes, I must kill the witch and also totally not. Yes, it's a paradox, an impossible contradiction. But so is Schrodinger's cat, both alive and dead. That still makes no sense to me in a practical, real, real world sense. But it has been proven to my satisfaction with super interesting experiments. All the creator's tiny, tiny building blocks use superpositions. It's a beautiful thing the Creator has left for us to find. As our understanding grows, we discover contradictions to things our forefathers held true. And we discover the key to these contradictions. And that is to understand that the very foundational pieces of everything are contradictions. Light is both a particle and a wave. Light is fully a particle and light is fully a wave. I love science and I love learning. Puzzles lead to answers and then more puzzles. Our understanding increases, yet always finite and thus infinitely small, compared to the Creator's infinite knowledge of all. This life requires us to make decisions with the information we have at hand, knowing full well it is flawed and incomplete. The Bible presents slavery as God's will, yet contains the command of Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. My experiences growing up in a Midwest American conservative Christian home are real to me. Miracles are real to me, as is my faith and the blessings I've received from the Creator. And although trying agnosticism seemed to solve some problems, it left no room for faith, miracles, and blessings, and I need and want those. In the way that Schrodinger's cat is fully dead and fully alive, the Bible is fully the true word of God. And there is room for any part of our understanding of any of us throughout time to grow. It is the only way I know to live with full faith God and Jesus are real and remain humble and respectful of the equally sincerely held religious beliefs of my neighbors. Right, sheeps? This is the essence of Paul's, thus we see through a lens darkly. We owe it to ourselves, our loved ones, family, friends, fellow Americans, regardless of religions, to be good to one another. And part of this is striving to improve our understanding 
of how to be good. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this brief introduction to God Getty. Are you interested in learning more? I also posted a video all about my God Getty hat and another one about how I made it. Subscribe, as I'll also be making more videos about individual topics around God Getty. Also, I want to know what you think about God Getty and questions and interests you have. So comment below. You can also visit the official God Getty website to learn more. Do you have anything to add, Sheeps? All right, maybe next time. See you guys next time.